For the longest time, I had a terrible struggle in regards to seeing the good in people. And it's a very funny thing because my perspective of people is very similar to the Tao, in that I do not see good and evil as a separate, dualistic frame, but rather an eternal dance between equal forces which both contain elements of their counterparts, and are thus not necessarily different things at all. Forgive me if that sounds confusing, that's my scholarly way of saying that shit just is what it is, and I'm cool with it. Those of you familiar with my videos thus far may have noticed that they're all titled with negative phrases. Stop making content. Don't believe in yourself. Stop trying to impress people, etc. This is a reflection of my own thinking. I have always tended to think very negatively about everything to begin with, and yet, in the end, what I always end up discovering through my own ruminations is that there is always a positive and reinforcing discovery at the end of exploring ideas which seem terrible and offensive on the surface. And I think what I've come to understand is why it is exactly that I have this intense, almost creative fascination with negativity and the evil in people. Because I've come to the conclusion that up until the past few weeks, I have been thus unable to integrate and come to terms with the evil in myself. I fancy myself someone that is very understanding of others, yet often when I am speaking to someone, I catch myself looking for ways to prove them wrong in a pretentious attempt to prove my own authority and intelligence. I fancy myself someone that loves humanity as it is, and does not shy away from the most unsightly aspects of our nature and our lives. And yet I have lived almost in constant anxiety about how other people are incredibly risky and dangerous to get close to. I like to think that I could lose everything, and I would actually be able to accept that. But I think it's possible I might have conflated acceptance with a sort of apathetic state, where I never get too attached to anything to begin with, so I don't have to worry about acceptance, which is not the same thing as being accepting. It's like refusing to play the game so that you can't lose. When I really examine myself, I find myself to be a bit, forgive the old-timey word, but repugnant to my own sense of morality. I find myself to be often a classic example of a hypocrite, someone who preaches a value and then lives in the exact way they have just taught others not to. My perception of this has always been that, well, I... I am attempting to discover myself through this process of exploring ideas that are juxtaposed to the person that I am. And in my analysis of the genuineness of these two statements, I find that actually both are true. I am certainly predisposed to hypocritical actions. But at the same time, I am genuinely trying to explore these ideas in this way. And this puts me in an awkward place when I'm trying to examine my own behavior because I'm beset by the feeling that I am at once lying to myself, but also exploring myself. And the struggle that I referred to in the beginning about not being able to see the good in people, I think it's better said as a conflict between good and evil in myself. But my problem is not actually in trying to recognize what is good and what is evil. It is the idea of good and evil itself that has left me disintegrated and in constant civil war with who I am. In the last video, I spoke about how terrible it is to demonize your coping mechanisms. And I see now why that idea captivated me so much. Because I realize now that it was me that was demonizing my own coping mechanism, which was my ego. Forgive me, you're about to hear the word ego a lot. But the ego is often seen by spiritual people as public enemy number one. It is said that our beliefs about ourselves and about the world are what blinds us to the true bliss of real, objective existence. And by objective, I do not mean the intellectual and rational understanding of the world as a physical place of matter, but a bit more of a mystical idea of the, the integration of all your inner natures into what I call the relationship with the divine. To this divine relationship, the ego is seen as a pariah. It is an invasive parasite that, for example, is the reason why humanity was cursed to leave paradise in the beginning of the book of Genesis for the sin of becoming aware of its own nature, and in that sense a kind of God in its own right. But consider this. Every child, completely naturally and without any influence, will come up with and love to play a game that they call pretend. And what is playing pretend other than playing with the ego? And there is another name for the ego, which is identity. 
Now, if I were to play house with you, what I'm doing is taking everything that I understand about the social role that I pick, father, brother, son, what have you, and then you do the same with a particular social role you choose, and then we just act out this game of identity without having to be told any of the rules. It is as if this game of identity is something that is completely in attunement with our own nature, and something that if we are denied, especially as children, we are made bereft of a fundamental building block of our personality and our psyche. And so as I said a few times before in these videos, it is still important that you do not attach yourself to the games you play with the things you choose to believe, because it's all a sort of game of pretend. At the same time, it is a very evil thing indeed to approach a child who is pretending to be a mother and to tell them, you are not a mother. You are a vulnerable, defenseless child who requires a real mother to take care of you. It is as if, by denying the child the right to pretend, we in fact deny the child the right to be. It's like telling someone that they can never interview for a job because you need a suit for an interview, and then telling them that they can't wear a suit because suits are only for people who already have jobs. You see, it is wrong to treat the ego as if it is anything other than a necessary part of who we are, which deserves love and fulfillment and nourishment. I believe it was Alan Watts who said that the goal of killing the ego is the last great defense of the invincible ego. Because all you end up achieving is further convincing yourself that the bad you that you detest so much is in fact so detestable that it has to be completely physically eradicated. Needless to say, that is not self-acceptance. And I have seen this in my own life, by demonizing my own ego, by seeing the products of my ego as foolish irrationalities from an evil source, I have thus seen the same thing in everyone else. And the funny thing about the game of socializing is that, unless you are particularly close to someone, you are almost always speaking not to them, but to their persona, which is itself a product of their ego. And so if ego is this evil thing that I am to avoid, then I am certainly going to be very afraid of just about everyone that I ever meet. And it makes so much sense, because I have often said to myself that I have no interest in casual conversation and small talk. I only ever feel comfortable when I can discuss intimate and personal subjects with others. But you see, it is not the intimacy that comforts me. In fact, it can itself often be quite stressful if I choose to be intimate with someone to whom I find boring, hostile, unintelligent, insensitive, etc. The problem is that anything other than intimacy fills me with a sense of crippling anxiety because I know I am certain to run into the products of ego, which I detest. Now, it would be a very pretentious thing indeed to act as if there is no danger to the ego. What I mean to say is not that the ego isn't something to transcend, but that transcending it will not come through the means which I have endeavored to kill or destroy or suffer ego death. By living my life in such a way, I have not even succeeded in killing my ego. I have only succeeded in making it exceedingly fragile and bitter, which has simply made me a more disintegrated person wrapped in constant anxiety because I've taken the border between me and the world and I've just said, well, have at it. I have nothing worth protecting here. Go ahead and attack all you like. Maybe once I'm attacked enough, I'll finally be rid of this terrible roommate that I hate so much. He'll just leave and then I can be at peace. This is already foolish enough, but it gets worse. By being such a devil to myself, every time I recognize the machinations of my own ego, what I have actually done is not just weaken my ego, but weakened my awareness of my ego. Because my brain has learned from me that every time I see my ego at work, I will punish myself. But the brain cannot rid itself of the ego. This whole situation is like a car trying to eject its own engine so that it can go faster. The real suffering does not actually come from the ego. It comes from the feelings that I feel looking at the ego, which I regard as a parasite in need of destruction. And so because my mind remains always steadfastly on my side, it simply retools itself as necessary so that I don't have to be aware of my ego or the egos of others very often. And the poison it's chosen for me to achieve this is self-isolation and near constant distraction. And so I've lived this life of constant anxiety, trying to eternally push something away. And the reason I can't escape is because that thing lives inside of me. 
So it's never going away until I do. This was something that I believe was taught to me very early. It is not merely some misunderstanding of how transcending the ego actually works. It's not a spiritual thing. I think it came from growing up in such a way as to not be able to tolerate the idea of my own stupidity or tendency to commit stupid acts of evil, let's say. I believe this is what happens when you raise a child only to follow the every command of their parents and the adults in their lives, and do nothing to nourish and encourage that imaginative spirit of which every child is born with. You create a child who believes that what comes naturally from them is an unsightly thing that needs to be re-educated and transformed into something else. But the problem is not the child, it is the adult's impatience and incompetence with the child. It is likely that the adult is themselves reenacting the same thing that was done to them, which also left them, as children, bereaved and clueless. And despite my best efforts, I believe that is what has happened to me. I have been turned against myself by the latent ghosts of my upbringing. My desire to undo what has been done to me, unfortunately, did not also come with a complementary understanding of what exactly that was. And it turns out that, in many ways, I was just using the same tools I was given to destroy myself to further destroy myself, believing all along that I was healing. You have to think how laughable and humorous it is to be someone whose life aspiration is to explore themselves and become more connected with who they are, and yet is doing it out of a desire to destroy a part of themselves that they don't like. That they never truthfully disliked themselves, they were simply taught that that was what they should do, by people who inflicted this feeling of disintegration and disconnection upon them in the first place. What a joke. And I think I'm finally at a point now in my life where I see the humor in it all. For the first time in my life, saying everything that I just said, I don't feel sad or anxious or angry. I just feel like laughing. What a game this has been my whole life up until this point. What a silly, ridiculous game. Well, I think that game is over, and it's time to play a new game. And I think the rules for this new game will be something like anything that comes from me, whether it is in the final analysis an impulse of something you could call good or evil, it is not to be regarded as anything other than truthfully and honestly myself. I am a ridiculous creature full of contradictions and ignorance, and that is to be regarded as simply amusing. How funny it is that in this whole soul search I've been going on for how to properly change my life and change myself into the person that I want to be, the conclusion I end up coming to was that the problem all along was the idea that I needed to change. I don't need to change. Change is inevitable. Change will happen whether I like it or not. The only thing I can actually do about that is futilely resist it. And what a foolish thing to do. I'm so afraid that I'm not going to get to live a good life that I resist the very nature of life itself, which is the flow, the process of things. I do not control the flow. The flow controls me. I can choose to surrender to it and hope that one day I will think of myself as someone who has made peace with reality. Or I can deny it and only succeed in destroying my awareness of it only to find myself one day at the end of my life having missed out on playing such a fun game as this. The game of life. The game of reality. I like games. I've always liked games. I like playing pretend. I like not judging the outcomes and just enjoying the play. Every game we play informs the way in which we play the next. So, thank you for joining me for this little game I've been playing lately. When I started playing it, I was beside myself with hysteria. I felt as if the foundation of who I am had become rife with an infection of lies, which were told to me both by others and then by myself. And now, just a few short weeks later, I feel I've come a big step closer to a more whole and complete relationship with myself. And wouldn't you know it, at the exact same time as that, I finished the basic structure of the house. What a fun game this all is.